today with us. I okay. probably don't need to introduce the speaker too much because he spent sure. <laughs> quite yeah. a lot of time in, uh, in uh, ICTP Safer, so many of you already know him much better than me. But nevertheless, let's follow the, the protocol. So he is from Montevideo in Paraguay. No. No, in Uruguay. In Uruguay. In Uruguay. Okay. We started yeah. badly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We started very badly. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. But I said correctly Montevideo, so it's clear that it was just Montevideo a typo. Of... Let's say a typo. Yeah. Well, there uh, is Montevideo, Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> so he graduated in Carnegie Mellon, right? In Carnegie Mellon. Carnegie Mellon in uh, 2007, yeah. and then he moved to Santa Barbara, IAS, Columbia. And then before joining DAISY, where he joined in 2019 and became a lead scientist in 2020. He was a faculty member and a Simons Papest Fellow uh, in ICTP SAFER. His research is broad, to say the least. It is multidisciplinary by design, I would say. And it lies at the interface between astroparticle, cosmology, gravitational wave, uh, and many other stuff. You, you read my white page. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But you didn't read, uh, you didn't uh, write uh, Paraguay there. <laughs> no, I did write <laughs> So uh, today's talk is about bootstrapping the two-body problem. So Rafael, please, Thank you can you start. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Very happy to be back. I'm giving this set of lectures, so I'm going to see many of you in this uh, two weeks. Let's see if this works. Oh, perfect. Okay, so many of you have already, well, I'm going to lecture, I'm lecturing about this topic, right? But many of you know more or less what uh, I was doing when I was here, and one of the reasons why we were all very excited about gravitational wave science, and which is what I'm going to talk about mostly, is because of the detections, right? We have the LIGO, uh, Virgo, and now Kagra collaboration detecting gravitational waves. By now, it's just many years in the making. And so I don't have to convince you that we open a new window into, new, into the universe. You already know that. That's very well established. So what I wanted to convince you of is that we can do a lot of very interesting physics with gravitational wave science. That the discovery potential in gravitational wave observations relies on our ability to make precise theoretical predictions. And that has not changed almost in any field where you look for deviations from your standard model, whichever standard model you have. Sometimes you can produce new physics if you can. Say so you turn on a collider and then the Higgs shows up. But most of the time, how can you see whether you have one model or the other? It's by detecting minute corrections to what the model predicts and what the data tells us. Okay? And one of those, one of, one of those minute corrections are how we're going to tell, for example, if, oh, I have a point. If the black holes that have been detected in the center of most galaxies, or we think they live in the center of most galaxies, including Sagittarius star, um, whether those are, I said black holes actually, right? Whether those things here that look very dark are indeed the black holes of general relativity or not. We have a pretty good idea. We think that that's something like a horizon. But having a very compact object, and having the fact that this is dark, that does not necessarily mean that those are the black holes in Einstein gravity. This could be any other object in nature. There could be modifications of uh, uh, what we think is the, the description of gravitational interactions. We really don't know. And why do I emphasize that we really don't know? It's because if you read, as I said yesterday, uh, the Nobel Prize to uh, Andrea Hensel, uh, Richard Hensel, for the discovery of a supermassive compact object at the center of our galaxy. Right? They did not say black hole, which is, which is something very unique. They are very careful and precise with Nobel Prizes. Right? But at the same time, they gave C. Roger Penrose the Nobel Prize for discovering that black hole formation. And he did, they did write black hole here. Right? It's a robust prediction of general relativity. So those two don't seem to go together yet. But they, got, they shared the prize. But what is this? It's a very strong indication that we all believe these are indeed the black holes of general relativity. But we still don't know. The jury is out there. And how are we going to find out? Well, nature is very kind since we don't control black holes production and collision. Uh, the universe is doing this for us, right? It's creating these uh, uh, black holes out there in the universe. And then through billions of years of evolution, they collide. They produce gravitational waves that we observe later. And that's the signal. And we're searching for that signal in a lot of noise. 
or Ricardo is not here, maybe he's watching online. So there's a lot of data analysis that has to be done to extract the properties. First, to detect. First, to say, okay, we saw something. And second, to detect, uh, to extract the properties of the source, given some assumptions. The assumptions that we're going to make are, well, are these, for example, the, the GR black holes, or these are new objects uh, in nature. The only assumption I'm going to make is that at long distances, more than, say, 10 kilometers, Einstein gravity describe, or like the, the long distance gravitational interactions are well described by Einstein gravity. That's the only assumption I'm going to make. I'm not going to make any assumption about what kind of objects these are, and this is going to be our ultimate goal. We want to learn about what these objects are by studying the production, as we do in collider physics. We collide the sky, something comes out, we study the output product, and then we learn about what was there in the middle. And that's basically uh, what I'm going to concentrate on. In the same way that we do in collider physics, we use quantum field theory, we do scattering amplitudes, we do Feynman diagrams. The same tools that historically had been applied in particle physics have now found their way into this problem, the relativistic two-body problem in general relativity. And that's what we would call perhaps uh, these modern approaches that I've been working on that I, I, I'm going to tell you more during the lectures, and I'm going to introduce now a little more colloquially. Um, so what is the challenge for us? So the challenge is that we have these two compact objects going around. Uh, we think they could be black holes, but also neutron stars. Those are uh, the end product of the, of the star evolution that can produce these very compact objects, which are about maybe three solar masses, 10 kilometers size, that they also collide and produce gravitational waves. And we want to tell them apart. We want to say, well, are those black holes or neutron stars, in particular, if they're very light? And we have detected objects, in fact, we, LIGO has detected objects, which are in that forbidden region of an object which could be three or four solar masses that we don't know what they are. Are they black holes? Well, black holes are not supposed to be that light. But neutrons are not supposed to be that heavy. So there, are, there is stuff out there. There could be, could be also the statistical fluctuations, errors in the, in the detection and so on, but we start seeing a lot of these guys. Then we might start seeing new objects that we don't quite understand in the picture that we have right now. So we, our standard model, as I said, though, is Einstein's equation. And then this part is my, my unknown. That would be like the T-mu. Of course, if this is GR, this would be 0, because vacuum equations it would be R mu equals 0. But it would be 0 in, a, in the sense that here there is all the long distance and short distance gravitational fields. If you think about that all the short scale gravitational fields is a source of the long distance gravitational interactions through nonlinearities of GR, then all the new fixes of the short scales could be mapped into some kind of stress tensor, like the Landau stress tensor that will also include the short scale physics. So that's our unknown. That's what we want to know. What are the degrees of freedoms on short scales? On long scales, we think we understand Einstein gravity. And now these guys um, go above each other for uh, millions of years until they get very close. Within minutes, say, for example, the binary neutron star, they, they merge within a few minutes. Uh, very famous uh, papers that we can see, obviously, in the, in the data, in the LIGO data. Uh, the last three minutes is more or less what we observe. There's a lot of information on those last three minutes. And the regimes of, of interest for us will be, well, the early phase in which these guys are still interacting perturbatively. That's called the inspired regime. Then they get close in some merger phase that is mostly done numerically. It's exact. GR solutions are very hard to produce. They take a long time. Here we can do analytics, which is what I'm mostly going to concentrate on. It's approximately, but it's very fast. And then there is some ringing at the end. After the black hole, the, the, the objects collide, and they form a, a, what we think is also another black hole, but we don't know. But in any case, this object will ring until it settles, and then you hear nothing. Essentially, the end of the story will be some ringing until the wave stops. So most of the cycles are going to happen here. And this will be, for us, the most interesting part, because not only we tell where to start the simulations and how to merge and uh, uh, construct waveforms, it's very clean. Here, we have very much analytic control, whereas here we have to run many, many simulations and then feed to some models and so on, so it's a little bit more um, dirtier. So what we're going to do is we're going to concentrate in the spiral regime of the two-body problem, and we're going to do what I like to call gravitational wave precision data. So we're going to do very precise analytic computations of the two-body problem in the regime in which perturbative calculations work. 
and we're going to extract the properties of whether these are black holes, neutron star, or something else entirely that we haven't yet seen through like minute, minute deviations from what we think this should predict and whether there are new things that could be um, uh, there in the data. Oh, here I have a quote, a quote by, by Ed. It's like, um, it's one thing in physics to write down equations, but then you have to solve them, right? That's sometimes easier said than done. So even though this is perturbatively, perturbative physics, any interesting system that you can solve exactly and realistic simply to describe the real world. So if you can solve something exactly and analytically exactly, it's very unrealistic. So the equations are hard. For the most part, the world is difficult. The universe, the equations describe the universe are very hard to solve, even if you know them, okay? So even though we know the equations, which are Einstein's equations, even though we have perturbation theory, still it's really hard to solve, okay? In some sense, and even classically, right? In some sense, also this happens in, in particle physics, QCD is known, and we still don't know how to solve QCD. There's a lot of quantum uh, corrections, but even if oh, there is no classical QCD in many ways, but if you had the classical solutions of QCD, in some sense, they do resemble a lot of what classical GR is. And ultimately, we're going to take those tools of trying to understand QCD or, or effective theories in particle physics to try to describe uh, the system. Okay? So that's going to be our main, our main goal. And this is what we've been doing, not just myself, a bunch of people. This goes back uh, to 20 years now. There's a whole review that I wrote while I was here, which I think is the most cited ICTP safer paper, uh, by the way, um, uh, which is using tools from uh, collider physics, um, in particular effective field theory ideas, and now modern scattering amplitude tools to understand what are the gravitational waves emitted by these two bodies going above each other. What do we compute? Well, we compute, say, a phase, a gravitational wave phase, and how we compute that? Well, we say there are, there are different modes of the, of the gravitational wave emission, but to lead in order, if you look at the gravitational wave phase, which is what we want to measure in the interferometry, we can say that the amplitude is dominated by, say, quadrupolar emission. So the orbital frequency and the gravitational wave frequency is just a factor of two. Of course, there are higher modes, factor of three, factor of five, and so on. We are not going to consider those in the amplitude. We're going to track the phase really well. So we say the orbital phase and the gravitational wave phase is just a factor of two, but we're going to track that really well. And really well means in a perturbative expansion in powers of the velocity. This is the velocity divided by the speed of light. As I'm telling you in the lectures, this V is actually is a bunch of ratio of different scales. It's not just special relativistic corrections. There are also mass ratio expansions that people use, sometimes called the self-force expansion. This is just the basic celebrated quadruple formula. And then there are corrections to the quadruple formula, there are corrections to these multiples, there are corrections to the dots, because the forces are also nonlinearly corrected, and all of that combines to get to very high order of precision. So where are we right now? We are at the so-called fourth post-Newtonian order, and that means next to next to next to next to leading order. That would be equivalent to a four-loop calculation in particle physics. And I say often the same thing, if you go to your friend and you say you did a for loop calculation and you tell him that you're not done, then I say, well, are you crazy? <laughs> Why are you still good? Well, the thing is that we are not yet ready. Even this very high level of precision is not ready for what the future of uh, gravitational wave science is going to be. So in some sense, which I like to um, um, compare, if you look at cosmology, what it was at the epoch in which we had the COVID satellite measuring the anisotropies in the CMB, with a lot of uncertainties, and then 20 years, we go to Planck, that basically almost down uh, to cosmic variance. Well, that's going to be the future of gravitational wave science. We are at Kobe with LIGO. We're going to get to Planck with LISA and ET. And for that, we need to make very good predictions to be able to really tell uh, all these models uh, apart in these very small um, uh, errors that the experiment is going to give us. The, the right now, as I'm going to say in a second, we are dominated by our uh, theoretical uncertainties. If you compare with the empirical reach of these future detectors, the one source of error right now is theory. And, and you don't want to be the source of error, especially because theories are cheap, right? You don't have to spend billions of dollars in a, in a new apparatus to, to beat down the, the, the statistical uncertainty or the, the experimental errors. 
You just have to get the theorists to do the calculations to a high level of precision, give them some computer pen and paper and coffee, and they'll be happy. So that's what we're doing. And why we need to get to high level of precision? Well, because the detectors are going to be extremely good, the sensitivity, the design sensitivity will be outstanding, but also because we want to not just detect, we want to be able to extract information. For example, if you look at waveforms, we want to be able to tell them apart. For example, if you have the vanilla one, which has equal mass, circular orbit, aligned spins, but then you start playing with the mass ratio, you start seeing structure. No circular orbits, you have precession. Then misaligned spins, also the orbits start precession. Uh, this, sorry, this is elliptic orbits, and this is precession. Uh, so gravitational wave experiments on ground space require more accurate waveforms, new theoretical challenges, and opportunity to precisely get all this information. So this is not enough. And that's why people are very excited, because we start, if, you, if you've been doing this for a living in, in uh, particle physics, for collider physics, and then you find the Higgs, and it looks like the next collider might not come, then you start looking at this, ah, I can, I can do this. And so we get a lot of excitement in, in the scattered amplitude community of people starting to work in gravitational wave physics. Uh, very good. So why it's also interesting or important to keep going is because, as I said yesterday, we cannot even tell the neutron stars and the black holes apart. If we didn't have a counterpart, if we hadn't seen the electromagnetic counterpart, from the gravitational wave data alone, we could not say whether the neutron stars that we observed were neutron stars or something else. Not necessarily a black hole, some exotics. And that's because the effects of the tidal deformation, the effects that will tell you whether you have an object which is a black hole, which uh, I'll tell you in a second, I already told you yesterday, um, has very peculiar properties about how they, they, they respond to an external perturbation. A neutron star, for example, will have this so-called tidal love number, and the effects of those tidal uh, uh, perturbations will come very late. That's why they are very high in the post-Newtonian expansion. That means you need to see them when you're going rapidly. That means a higher frequencies. So if you have a point particle approximation, you miss this effect because the waveform will change a little bit, and that's what we want. We want to see that small, minute correction which enters a very high post-Newtonian order, a five loops, the next order, that we haven't fully finished yet, to be able to even see this uh, uh, tidal effect. Now, it so happened that for, for neutron stars, even though this is, there is a perturbative expansion, which is the, the, the post-Newtonian expansion here, but there could be a large dimensionless number sitting in front of this, of this 5 p.n. order. And that's why the love numbers of, a, of an object whose um, size is bigger than the gravitational radius, the gravitational radius over GM, if you are a three, four, four, five times bigger than that, and then this enters a very high power, the, the, these dimensional numbers will be, say, five to the four to the fifth, then you can have an enhancement. And that's what happens for neutron stars. The love numbers are large, and therefore, even though it's an effect, that we don't fully control, it, it mimics what we cannot understand. So we can start maybe putting some bounds there. But amazingly, black holes do not have this tidal deformability. They have zero love number in four dimensions. This is a very peculiar fine-tuning type in nature, which is um, at the completely classical level that is understood in general relativity, because when you do the matching, when you say, OK, there's a response to a black hole, and that black hole will create a quadrupole, you look. You look for the quadruple far away. Where is the gravitational perturbation? You don't find anything. So there is no perturbation. There is no love number. And it's n but it's not well understood. I mean, naturally, you should have it because a, a neutron star has it. So why a black hole would not have it? You just take the compactness down, and there is no reason why it should go away. The very large number I told you earlier will go to 1. Well, 1 becomes 0. There is some understanding of why this happens. I told you something yesterday, uh, some of you. Uh, but this is very peculiar, but it's also a handle of new physics because there is no standard model background. That means that if you see an object which is heavier than a neutron star, so it cannot be this, because the neutron star does have that deformability, but black holes do not, you say a 10 hundred solar mass black hole, a, a super massive, a massive compact object that has a waveform that looks like this, and then front page of uh, Folia de Sao Paulo and New York Times. Because that we haven't seen. And that's why we need to precisely understand this very well to tell them about. What can it be? Question. Yeah, so all, black holes all black holes in four dimensions in Einstein gravity. Now, you change Einstein gravity, 
you start getting deformability. If you put an R square term, then you get uh, uh, a double effect. If you, um, well, massive gravity, I don't know if it's been done. Um, but in principle, if you go to higher dimensions, you also get uh, a, a loft number. Um, what was I saying here? Yeah, so there is no standard model background, but it's a very nice thing that, that uh, this is also a paper that uh, uh, was initiated while I was here, um, which I think is like the third, most likely paper. Um, which is, well, what could it be, right? If, if, uh, if, the, um, if the black holes don't have love numbers, but the black hole have an environment, any kind of environment, for example, axion light particles, then you could have the deformability of those clouds which look like gravitational atoms around black holes. And those do leave an imprint in the waveforms. And by looking at those minute corrections, we could learn about, for example, new ultralight particles in nature through high precision computations of gravitational wave phase that will tell us that we observe something that is not there in the background because black holes don't have tidal love numbers, but they black holes are not modified. It's just that we're seeing the effects of new physics. For example, kilometer, Compton kilometer wavelength particles of 10 to the minus 10 EV uh, condensing around black holes through super radiant stabilities, which is basically what has produced um, this class. That's one possibility. There is boson stars. It could be a lot of or something completely uh, new that we haven't yet uh, seen. So that's the name of the game. That's my motivation. We're going to get to high precision because we want to tell these guys apart, because we want to see precisely how we distinguish these objects. And getting to five loops, means we are four loops now, means that we need to uh, crank a little more. But also, there is a lot of structure here, and how right now these tools that have been developed are also teaching us a little bit more about like GR itself, and how this series uh, behaves. And so there's a lot of very interesting physics and mathematics that gets into this business. And that's what I'm going to tell you in the second part of my talk. It's like, what are the tools that we're using? Mostly, we want to do post-Newtonian bound orbits emission. But recently, we have also understood how to do the so-called unbound case, which is scattering, which is what we do at colliders. You scatter these guys, they emit gravitational waves, and you collect that at infinity. This problem and this problem seem to be completely unrelated. This is a bound state, which is often done in the so-called post-Newtonian expansion. Where there is a bound state, it means that there is a scale of the bound state, which is like gm over r order v squared. There's another parameter in the, in the business. Whereas this so-called post-Minkowskian is just mean weak fields, but all velocities, they are not bound to be related to scales. This resumes this, but this is unbound. So how are we going to go from here to here? Well, we develop also something called the boundary to bound correspondence that tells you how you compute something here and then you automatically get an observable here. And therefore, all the tools now that we can use here, we come up here and we get all the resum post Minkowski computations for free. We get all the velocities for free. And that's, that's, that's beautiful because then you never have to do the bound complications of coordinates and so on, you just set the problem in, in, in Minkowski, and you never leave Minkowski, which is very nice. Uh, very good. So how is this effective field theory approach? It's just a brief, very uh, uh, short uh, uh, introduction, which I'm also telling you guys during the lectures. Uh, in the bound case in particular, so we have a, a typical size of the objects. If you have a black hole, say, you have the Schwarzschild radius, a neutron star is not that much bi uh, bigger. Uh, then there is the separation. You put those two guys in a binary. It's a typical size of the bound state, and then it emits gravitational waves. Boop. What does the effective field theory do? Well, you see three different scales. You deal with one at a time. And this was the idea put forward in initially by Walter Goldberger and Ira Rostin, and it goes by the name of non-relativistic general relativity because of the parallels with non-relativistic QCD. Uh, where this is just bound states of heavy quarks. There's a lot of analogies, and therefore, that's what the name came. Did not stick, unfortunately. Um, now it's all effective field theory approach, whatever it is. Um, but the main idea is that it, this is just basically in any, in any system, even statistics, right? You have some partition function. You have a, an effective action. So you have a path interval. If you know the path interval of the universe, you can solve everything, right? Well, here is the same. We just care about gravity. We just care about this guy. So if you can construct the effective action, 
you, you know the binding energy of the system, you know the width of the state, which tells you about emission, right? All you need to do is disentangle all the scales. This is, as I said at the beginning, my standard model. This is GR plus whatever team you know you have for the neutron star or the new object or whatever. That part, this scale, we don't know much about, but it's going to be the easy one in a sense because we're going to match into a theory in which there will be a bunch of parameters that we don't know, but we're going to get from data. If we know the, the theory, we can match those numbers. If we don't know the theory, like if the love numbers are of some unknown object, then we're going to get them from the data. Then all this we control. This we control because here and here is just GR, plain old GR that we can solve. This is the scale we don't necessarily know. This is the new physics. How this imprints the scales that we do understand and love, and that's what basically we're going to do. So how does this work? We do this matching one scale at a time. So you have an object. This object has some size. It's been perturbed, for example, by the companion. So in the long wavelength approximation, this looks like a point particle. And here I even wrote the particle action here. Um, so there is a point particle action, and you start seeing these deformations to quadruple couplings with the uh, uh, gravitational field, curvature effects. Yeah. I have a question about the measure. This is a function of the gravitational field that you integrated that varies on a scale of order lambda minus 1 or r minus 1 and so on. So you're solving for all the gravitational degrees of freedom, so you can see here how these objects move and how they emit. Basically, the gravitational fields are all gone. You can compute, sorry, you can also compute a one-point function if you care about the, the uh, waveform. But we just care about the phase. In this case, W will be a function of the positions of the particles. So they're not integrating over R? No, this is gravitational fields on the scale of R, gravitational field on the scale of R minus. So I'm saying that the, the typical, the G mu nu, we have some variance, say, of order of G, which is, for example, if you had the binding potential, is what you get, right? This is 1 over R, you take a derivative, it's 1 over R squared, so it's 1 over R, the 1 over R squared. So there are scales of the gravitational field that go like this. There are also scales that go on shell. The ones that are radiated away, these have a D squared, which is 0, so this has the lambda. So this varies on a scale of the gravitational emission, which is R over V. And then there is a short scale, which I don't know, but I'm saying whatever is happening is happening inside the black hole. So those are scales which are UV for me. Um, and how do I deal with that UV? I don't know. It's by matching. For example, the mass, as I told you yesterday, I don't know what the mass is. It's, it's some binding energy of the system. We think we know the mass of a neutron star, what could be, but without some uncertainties, we can match if you know the full theory. If you don't, you get this from observation. And that's the parameter that knows about the scale of the UV, the same with the tidal uh, deformability, we know about this scale. So this point particle actually, we know about this. And then we put them in the bound, and we have two of those point particle actions that know about all the UV, all the unknown for me will be hidden inside this Q, this M, the, um, well, the spin that I didn't write, and uh, all the possible terms that you can write in your effective theory. Um, so, as I was telling you, this depends on the position. So if you have a real part of your effective action, you get like a binding energy. Then there's a width of your effective action, and then you get the emission, the radiation. And this is not necessarily new. For example, the binding and the, and the potentials, the forces, uh, getting out of this, this integrating this, this path integral has been known since Feynman or Wheeler and Feynman. They literally set up precisely the same thing. The main, the main difference, and this was also done by, by uh, uh, Michael Duff when he got the Schwarzschild solution and, and Thibault, Damour, and, and company, uh, is just understanding that this calculation is nothing by iterating Green's functions, so it's not really loops. It's just the same way that you iterate Green's functions in classical physics. It's like three-level diagrams, as you can see. These guys are sources, so they don't propagate. And therefore, you can use the same tools and essentially the same ideas that you use in particle physics. What is new here, what is essentially new, is that you can disentangle this whole propagator, which in principle knows about the binding, but also about the radiation, into modes. And that's essentially what the effective field theorists do, uh, do. And for example, if you have a propagator, a full propagator that enters there, you can expand it if you say it's quasi-instantaneous, it's a basically a Coulomb interaction plus velocity correction. 
and that's what we call potential modes. And then there's the on-shell radiation modes that give us the emission. So instead of doing this path integral all at once, in which we integrate the full propagator and get relativistic integrals, which we will do in a minute, uh, it's much more convenient to split that into two different uh, integrals. One at the scale of the potentials, and another one in another theory in which I already solve for all the potentials and integrate the radiation. And that is done in this way. You basically solve for all the potentials, and then you match into a theory in which now the whole binary is treated as a, a multiple moment, including the binding. The binding energy of the system will also dress my coupling in the effective theory that knows about the short scale, which now is the bound state. That radiates. The, the time variations of this quadruple will not only be because the excess move, also because the binding is changing in time. And therefore, if you have a complicated relativistic calculation in which you have full propagators, which is this path integral, this J's are the excess, and this is vacuum vacuum. If you have some complicated integral like here, or that you can have even more interactions like a tree loop, then you go and then you find the binding itself, and then you look at all the corrections from velocities to this binding propagate, all static, so these are static integrals, easy to do. And then you match into your queues, and in the queues, you look for the regions in which you propagate. And therefore, you can have a three loop uh, calculation or a four loop or higher loop done in steps in which you first look at which part is binding, you match into your queues, and then you do just the radiation loop. And when you split it this way, the calculation is significantly easier than doing this. And that's how we have gotten uh, to very high order. Right now, after a concerted effort that includes seminal work also by Ricardo Sturani, uh, and, uh, and collaborators, and myself, and, and Thibaut Amour, and Luc Blanchet, and company, we are now very confident about this four post-Newtonian order. We have some understanding of IPM, but we haven't yet finished it. We think we need to get to 6 p.m. to be able to get to the level of precision that, this, um, um, that these detectors require. Okay? So we have gone a long way sin since Newton. In fact, the very first post-Newtonian calculation was done uh, by this guy called Droste, that many of you might never have heard of. Uh, and it's, uh, it's known as the einstein ife hoffman action, or potential, even though this was done in the 30s. This guy did it many years before. Um, it was very nice, actually, the way, the way he did it. This was communicated by Lorenz, D. Lorenz. It was a Dutch guy that was lost to history, unfortunately, right after uh, uh, 1915, right after Schwarzschild. Uh, the first post-Newtonian correction to the motion beyond Newton. I, 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 unfortunately, I don't know how this guy did it. Uh, I haven't looked at his paper. But I have looked at his paper, Einstein, and the way they did it was through the covariant conservation of T mu nu with some point particle uh, ANSAT. And then there is a bunch of, a table, a bunch of surface interests that are done to basically use House Gauss's law to know how the particles move so they know how the field reacts so the whole thing is conserved. And it's a mess. And this is just to get the first post-Newtonian iteration, and this was done much later than when this guy uh, did it. By the way, there is something very nice, is that, again, emphasizing how precision is important. It's because this 1 p.m. correction is famously responsible for the uh, uh, periastron advance, right? in GR, because as you know, the 1 over R potential does not give you any periastron. You, you, any 1 over R square will start giving you a periastron. Uh, but it turns out that the 1 over R uh, square periastron shift is not the main uh, uh, correction. The main correction is Jupiter. This is the anomalous correction that could not be accounted for. So it's through a precision measurement and through a new, in this case, new gravity theory beyond Newton is that we learned that there was something new there. Because you remove Jupiter through high precision, and then uh, voila, we get a new force. So precision has been historically uh, very important. It's not that we see something. We see something with a small deviation when you take everything into account, and they say, uh, aha, this cannot be accounted for. But you have to be very certain that Jupiter was doing most of the work, right? Um, very good. So how this is done in our, in our formalism, this is very simple. This is a binding potential, so basically it's a three-level exchange. Then you 
and start including these quasi-instantaneous corrections that will give you the V-square corrections to the 1 over R. And then there's the non-linear disk of GR that will give you the G-square correction. And this is relatively straightforward that right now an undergraduate can do in five minutes. And, and in fact, I don't have time to, to explain, but I, together with my advisor, I developed the spinning calculation, and, and together with Ira, we put spins in these wall lines, and all, all of a sudden we had a new result, which uh, was done very quickly with a, the right theory that had never been done before <coughs> at the time. No, no, this is just how they scale. So the typical ah. GM over R is the one, the V square correction is this, and this is this. No, here there are many terms. There's V dot R square, there's V square, V1, V2, blah, blah, blah. So this is just to tell you where they come from and what is the order, how they scale. So maybe I should, instead of putting here uh, explicit, some quotation marks. Uh, but the nice thing is that we identify exactly where everything comes uh, from. Uh, very good. So the four post-Newtonian, this is uh, um, the state of the R, uh, involves now iterations of Feynman integrals to fourth loop orders. Uh, these integrals are hard to, 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 to compute. There's a lot of technologies that we can borrow for particle physics to do this uh, four uh, loop integrals. But interestingly now, the, there's a new effect. And the new effect has to do with the fact that the radiation, when you radiate in the binary, you get kicked. That radiation also scatters off of the geometry. As you get kicked, the, you scatter off the geometry and comes back. And it kicks you back. So that energy never left. It gets renormalized. And therefore, you get a correction to the binding energy that resembles the exact same thing that happens in the lamp shift with a soft photon. In the case of the soft photon, there is a, there is a wave function of the, of the bound state if you have a hydrogen atom. And therefore, it's a loop effect. So there's an h-bar. Here, the, the, the nonlinearity that is done through the, through the QED coupling is in classical GR through the gravitational interaction with the potential, the binding, uh, sorry, the, the um, uh, Newtonian potential of the binary system, the GM over R of the whole binary. It's like the Schwarzschild background that makes the wave uh, deflect. So there is radiation, there is scatter of the geometry. This is uh, co so-called tail effect. It's literally the same as the lamp shift. And this lamp shift, as you know, gives you a logarithm. Well, this tail effect also gives you a logarithm. So when I'm telling you that at each post-Newtonian order, there are different powers of V, different powers of G, and this is because G of M over R scales like V squared, there are also logarithms. And this, once you see logarithms, you can resum them. You can understand where they come from. They're obviously associated with some divergences that you have to understand. In the case of the lamp shift, it's an infrared divergence. And in fact, even Feynman got it wrong. He was trying to calculate the lamp shift, which in this case is the one loop of the ultrasoft uh, photon radiation. This is the bound state in the case of the hydrogen atom. He calculated this originally. He got it wrong. He had something very similar to an ambiguity parameter. And ambiguity parameters, because you have divergences, infrared divergences and ultraviolet divergences too, are what the traditional approaches have often used to regularize these issues. Uh, because they are regularization dependent in many ways, they introduce these ambiguities. And Feynman had some kind of ambiguity to fix um, the uh, celebrated, uh, uh, I forgot the, the value of the lamp shift, that uh, to get it right, he had to basically fix it by hand. And he gave credit in that t at that time to French and Baikov, even though he, they held for a year their, or two their paper, and then Vita, Dyson, and even Lamb beat them, uh, even though Feynman told them not to publish because they had it right and he had it wrong. And he apologized to them in the famous uh, footnote 13 by now, which was, I think, footnote 12 is empty, so footnote 13 could be number 13, in which he basically said that he made a mistake in a Feynman way, of course. Um, but the same happens in gravity. And the same problem created a lot of trouble in the traditional approaches. And we solved it by precisely understanding correctly how the problem of the tails was very similar to the lamp shift. Uh, very good. So now we are moving forward. So we not only have tails because you scatter off the geometry, you have tails also because you're scattering also on, on the, the curve geometry, so that would be the angular momentum, so not only the mass, the angular momentum, but also 
the potential caused by the quadrupole itself. And then there's something called the memory, which is the radiation scattering of the earlier radiation. All of this will enter. And these are the pieces that are giving us trouble, and that's why this has not been fully completed yet. But soon, hopefully, this will be completed. And this will be very close to saying that we understand uh, the five post Newtonian, at least binding the potential and the tails and the memories. Most of the stuff that goes into the waveform, we still don't have the fluxes that are needed at 5 p.m. We do have the fluxes at 4 p.m. to construct waveforms, but this is uh, in the making. But you see, there is a long way, but progress now has been uh, faster, right? Because we have new tools, we have new ideas, and we understand this better. But there are still new challenges and, and, and conceptual and theoretical uh, computational challenges that we need to overcome. So what I'm going to tell you about, about now is like when we were doing this um, uh, post-Newtonian calculation, we were doing this uh, uh, for a while. The, uh, on the on the other side, I mean, there was all these developments in collider physics about scattering amplitudes and so on. So we started thinking, and also the people in amplitudes. Well, can we look at this in the other way? Every post-Newtonian order mixes Gs and Bs, but if you turn your head, at, if you look at an order in G, but all orders in B, you start seeing this post-Minkowskian expansion. And as I was telling you, this case is scattering. Here, we don't do any bound state. We have, for example, a deflection. We compute what is the impulse. So you have the, my effective theory is the same. And here, there is a P dot, it's the same. But instead of looking at the potential to construct a waveform, we construct directly the observable by computing, say, an impulse. And from that impulse, we get an angle. And this angle, as I'm going to show you, which is gauge invariant, will give us information ultimately at some point about the bound state. That will be the, the second part. But at this point, it will be just computing a relativistic, uh, this is Lorentz invariant uh, uh, scattering angle. And we will see that we're going to do this in an expansion in GM over some impact parameter. But we, GM over B, but we're going to do it to all orders in velocity. So the integrals that we're going to end up with are going to be slightly different than the static integrals that we had in post-Newtonian. We're going to have relativistic in integrals. These Ds are full propagators, full P squares. And these linear propagators and these deltas, they come because I had to do this consistently and iteratively, which means I need to evaluate this on the trajectory. And when you solve for the trajectory, you solve x double dot equal force, the double dots or the dots, if you go to the velocity, will be 1 over omegas. And the omegas are like k dot u's. And those are these guys. And the i epsilons, the i zeros, which are very important, it has to do with when you solve the equation, you integrate, say, between minus infinity to t. And that time t is what you observe. But the minus infinity boundary, you have to remove the divergence. And sometimes this is done by properly choosing your Green's function. So you use retarded boundary condition. That's usually what happens. Here you can also uh, ask me about which boundary conditions we use for these propagators. I'll tell you that in a minute. So what has happened in this, in this area? This area does not have yet an, as an illustrious history, but it's getting there. Uh, the first to, uh, to uh, Damur's knowledge, <laughs> I guess, and to my knowledge through what uh, Thibaut, who was one of the first to, to uh, bring this back to life and suggest that this was something that we should look at, uh, it's through a calculation do done by um, Westphal, I forgot his first name, in 1985, where this guy computed the scattering angle. And he computed the scattering angle at order g, gm or b, and g squared. And, and what are the parameters that matter here? This is relativistic, so we write the answer in terms of the boost factor, which tells us about the relative velocity. And in many results, this energy, this total energy divided by the mass, will appear. It will be very useful as we will see in a minute, it's also related to the mass ratio and the energy. The result is here. He, this is the chi 1, this is the chi 2. The coefficient of the GM over B at order 1 divided by the energy is just a function of gamma. The coefficient divided by this E is just a function of gamma. This calculation is very complicated in this paper, but we and also Cliff Chan, Michael Solon, and I.R. Rostin using amplitude method and we did it just by using the same tools that I just described to you, but by keeping the integrals relativistic. 
Uh, we basically reproduce this very easily because it's just two diagrams. The same 1 p.m. correction I showed you before that explains Einstein for Hoffman explains this. And this calculation is semi-trivial. You can also do it uh, uh, relatively quickly. Notice something very interesting. If I know the um, prop limit, if I take the mass of the, uh, of the object, or the mass ratio, if you want, nu is the symmetric mass ratio, m1, m2 divided by m squared, the big m squared. If that goes to 0, this guy did not find out. The, the, I, I, I purposely divide it by gamma, so there are nulls inside the gamma. But if I divide it by gamma, and I take gamma to infinity, this becomes the mass. This is 1. So the probe will be just this. This gamma will be just the velocity of the particle, because the black hole is sitting there. But notice that I can bootstrap the whole result by just knowing the probe limit, because there are no nulls here. All I need to know is that I just have to divide by this big gamma. I keep that in mind because this is going to be very useful, because a lot of information can be bootstrapped by understanding the symmetries of this problem. For example, up to second post-Minkowski and order, everything is just prob. Just the test body limit determines uniquely the solution if you understood that it, it goes like this. The most interesting one came uh, later, and this was a, a breakthrough done by uh, Speed Burn and collaborators at the beginning of 2019. They used similar tools as, as Cliff Chon and, and, and Solon and, and Rostin to compute the third post Minkowski order. This is a two loop calculation. So we reproduced this result a year later using the tools of effective field theory. It's just these diagrams. And the answer looks like this. So now you see, for the first time, it starts getting uh, more interesting, because now the factor of nu appears here. But what does this mean? This means there's a lot of stuff that is test, but the so-called one self force correction, the first correction in the mass ratio, does matter. But also, again, uniquely determines the answer. If I know the first new correction, I would have known this to all orders. This calculation starts getting structure. These are polynomials. Now the cinch function appears. The way they got this answer is slightly complicated. The way we got the answer was relatively straightforward. Why? Because we start using even more modern tools to do these calculations. One of them is to realize that this cinch is nothing but a log. No, it's not the same x as before, not the x that we use in, in, in post-Newtonian gravitational waves, which is gm omega to the 2 thirds that goes like p squared. This x is this parameter related to gamma. And uh, we use x because the people who uh, thought about this, they call it x originally. <coughs> and this cinch is nothing but a log. If you see a log, uh, there is a running here. And lo and behold, we realized that we could solve also uh, people uh, in, uh, have been using these ideas in particle physics since a long time, that you can solve these integrals by doing differential equations. You take derivatives with respect to the parameters, and then you rewrite everything in terms of a basis of integrals. And once you have that basis, you have like a matrix that relates how this basis of integrals evolve in that parameter. So you solve the differential equation. The only thing you need to know is the boundary conditions. The good thing is that the boundary condition, for example, with x goes to 1, is the post-Newtonian calculations that we were doing earlier. So if we solve the differential equations and we give the PNEFT boundary conditions, the problem is solved. So we completely bootstrap the answer. We solve our PN calculation, we solve the differential equation, we get the whole summation. The RG flow is giving us the whole summation for free. And that's the first one, it's a log. And it's relatively straightforward because it's so-called canonical. If this differential equation is canonical, then the answer is, can be written in terms of polylogarithms. One of them is just log. <coughs> what is what? Well, in this case, V will be related, gamma is related to v through this. We're running x, but we cannot run it in gamma. It's just that the log appears in this funny function. As a function of gamma, is the cinch. As a function of x, you run, because basically x, gamma, and v are all related. So if you solve this equation, you put the boundary at x equal 1, which means v goes to 0. The differential equation moves you in velocity and gives you this whole series, because log of x then becomes cinch of gamma. Is the velocity that runs? No, no. What I mean is that the whole solution that you get is the solution of a differential equation similarly that you get. 
the strength of the coupling in QED changing with energy, right? At a different value of the energy, you run and you get a logarithm enhancement. The scattering angle runs between a small velocity and relativistic velocity through this equation. <clears throat> a higher order, it becomes not canonical. So it's not a, 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 um, a sum of polylogarithms, and then they appear elliptic integrals. And that's why the structure started to appear. We found now that a four-post Minkowskian order, the solution to the scattering angle, it starts to depend on these funny functions, which are the elliptic of the first and second kind. So not only you get polylogarithms, I don't write it, I'm, I'm, maybe I have it next. You don't only get polylogarithms, you also get elliptic integrals, and that makes the calculation um, much more challenging. It is now a, a three-loop calculation. It's a more complicated relativistic calculation. It's not just polynomials anymore. It's not only polylogarithms. It's also elliptic integrals. So we start seeing a lot of structure in the solution of general relativity, in particular this scattering angle, um, that we could not see from post-Newtonian. Post-Newtonian only see these polynomials in B, but they resum into these uh, functions. And that's been done through solving this differential equation. Again, now we get the boundary conditions and the x goes to one limit, but now we have something new. Before, when we go to x equal 1, in particular at 3 p.m., most of the um, non-relativistic limit of going to very small velocity is dominated by potentials, by those forces that are quasi-static. Now we have the tail effect. The tail effect starts at 4 p.m. at G4. So now the boundary conditions that we get don't only know about potential, they also know about radiation. And that means that the answer not only contains these elliptic functions that are from the potentials, you also get logarithms. This boils down to a log of V at the end of the day, which are due to the radiation. So we get a combined effect between the potentials and the radiation that includes the logarithm, the beta logarithms that give you a full result which is completely devoid of the ambiguities and divergence that you can impose Newtonian because you basically get the result like once. All of that takes care of itself. Uh, very good. So I haven't told you about boundary conditions. I've solved all these equations without boundary conditions. Well, the boundary conditions comes uh, in, in putting the boundary solutions of this differential equation. And I meant the boundary conditions for the propagators. When I do integrals, I have a p-square. And which P square you use? Are you using retarded? Are you using advanced? Are you using Feynman? Well, the way this is done is that we get first a so called conservative part that will give us a binding energy. And for that, we use the Feynman propagators, which are time symmetric. Using those Feynman propagators, um, which are time symmetric, uh, we get just the conservative part of the scattering angle. That includes also these logarithms because the binding energy is what we get through this tail effect. But it's not the end of the story. We want to get the full radiative effects. We don't want to just do con conservative. And that is done in a little bit more uh, uh, QFT baggage, which is you need to do the so-called in informalism. It just boils down to saying we won't retard the boundary conditions, not just Feynman. We don't want time symmetric propagators. We won't retard the propagators. And that's what the arrows are. The in informalism, we doubles everything and gives you some keldy schwinger parametrization of the propagator. It just takes care of the arrows. And therefore, you do, a, again, the same calculation. You get a conservative part, which is the Feynman calculation, actually the real part, because the imaginary part is the width, that you don't care, as we were saying earlier. And then you get also a dissipative part. But it boils down to just saying, oh, instead of using Feynman, that gives me a conservative part, I do the full retarded calculation. And here we were the first to do this. This one, we arrived at the exact same time. We posted the paper within a day of each other when we finished the 4 p.m. conservative. This one, now we did uh, ourselves for the first time. And this is the full 4 p.m. calculation of the complete scattering angle, including both conservative and dissipative effects. And it has been confirmed by independent calculations, seen both in the post-Newtonian and post-Minkowskian expansion. <clears throat> now, where are we now? Well, there was a, a, a calculation done by a group in Humboldt, uh, led by Jan Plefka and collaborators, students and postdocs, that did the G5 conservative at first order in the mass ratio. We still don't have the full G5. But there's good indications that uh, this might be, we might be able to solve this in the near future. What we're learning from all of this, that at the end of the day, it's all about the integrals. 
We need to be able to identify. The reason they were able to do this is because they were able to set up the problem in a way in which they can construct this basis of master integrals. They can look at the differential equations, and they can do look at the solutions. All of this is, is a lot of algebra, a lot of um, most of the developments that have been done for particle physics are now kind of obsolete for this problem. We're at a very high level loop level. Most of the tools have been developed for multiplicity, so you 3 jets, 4 jets, whatever. Here we need very high loop and one scale, so that's why uh, it's a different beast, but some of these tools have been developed right now. You hear people telling you, oh, we use scattering amplitudes because we can match in the unitarity cuts. You don't need to... Um, uh, do anything off share, Feynman diagrams are terrible. Now, Feynman diagrams are great. There's a lot of redundancy here. You can simplify your life a lot and do everything with Feynman, and we have constructed all of this using Feynman, and we have not found a problem here because of Feynman. We have a problem because of the integrals. That's the real bottleneck uh, here. Uh, okay. um, this is not the problem. Okay? So at the end of the day, this is just about the integrals. There's a lot of tools from particle physics that go into these calculations, including these differential equations, but there is yet a lot to be learned. Why? Because even though we are a very high PM order now, that G5, we haven't even completed the full 4 PM, and getting into the 5 PM, we need the G6, which we haven't even started. So even though we get a lot of velocity corrections, we haven't even matched yet what post-Newtonian can do, right? So we need to find some kind of hybrid in which we can use the best of both uh, words. Is there any gauge dependence in these calculations? No, these are angles. These are angles. Yeah. So, but scattering amplitudes usually can have gauge dependence, but this is not. No, no, they are ca the, the scattering amplitude is also, uh, it particularly in, in general, but in, in the classical case, you even find that the scattering amplitude can go straight into an observable. So the redundancies are not because of gauge dependence. The, the redundancy seems No, the redundancy here in how you set up the calculation is in the Feynman rules, the Feynman diagrams, everything that goes into setting up the effective action that then gives you an angle. That you can play with. Well, you choose a gauge for the propagator, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah, we, we basically remove all this redundancy by being clever about your gauges, about everything that you can play with, such that the calculation is actually much simpler than what people had originally uh, thought. The gauge doesn't have a name. Well, we use the donder at quadratic, but then later it's a mess that simplifies everything. Huh? Yeah, what is gauge dependent is how you do the calculation. The answer is gauge invariant. It's the same as in any particle physics cal calculation. In QED, you can use different gauges. You can go to a Coulomb gauge, you can have the Feynman, Landau gauge. Those are gauges. When you compute an observable, you get a gauge independent answer. In fact, you can see that the answers are all gauge independent. You can put flags everywhere and the flags go away. Yeah? No, I was just interested in this uh, comparison with the running of the coupling because, um, th I mean, this is a differential equation, but how is it comparable with running of the coupling because is it's there one an parameter. Is the energy scale, is it comparable to exactly. an energy Exactly. It's scale? one parameter which is associated with the velocity. And it tells us, in this case, what runs is the master integral. The solution to an integral that depends on momenta that are related because the momenta, the u's, the u's are related by this gamma, which knows about v, and the integrals that I had are integrals that know about the velocity. So there's the velocity is the scalar integral. The answer can only depend on gamma, which is the product of these two guys, and the velocity is what moves your flow. So the integrals, depending on which value of v you have, we have different values depending on the solution to this RG flow. And then you just need to know those integrals in the x goes to one limit, which is the static case that we already did. Mm -hmm. And that's how these things run. Yeah, thank you. So what's the answer? Let me just flash the answer. Uh, this is the whole radiator rea radiation reacted uh, scattering angle. No, sorry, this is the impulse. You see here the functions which you get. These are polynomials in gamma, the h's. But you get logs, you get dialogs. Um, you start getting the elliptics that should be here. Uh, I don't see them now. Uh, um, the dialogs and the uh, e's and k's. And this is the exact full solution of the total impulse that includes also 
and which has been confirmed by post-Newtonian calculations, includes also the energy loss. Famously, uh, Thorne and Kovacs in the 70s, many years ago, computed the third post-Newtonian order, the GQ radiative uh, uh, effects, not to all orders in velocity, there were some numerics uh, involved. Uh, we not only uh, did this, which was also done by other people before, we gave the next one, the G4 total radiated energy, and it was, uh, I, I find this kind of amusing because uh, in the paper by Thorne and Kovacs, they actually had a Feynman diagram approach. They didn't use it, but they even mentioned it, that the classical problem can be solved quantum mechanics, and sometimes the quantum solution is that the classical. Well, a lot of these tools make solving the problem much more efficient at the way that these people tackle directly by solving the field equations of H mu nu and all the tensor structure and so on. You can do that directly at the level of the path integral, and then you land in these integrals that you ha just have to do. Um, then you get an angle, and this angle uh, has uh, uh, both conservative and, and, and dissipative part. This is the total thing. This is what I told you. Uh, this is back to back. As you can see, we got the conservative at the same time, but we got the full answer uh, uh, a year, almost a year later. That includes all the dissipative effects. It's not just the conservative part, but also the dissipative part. <coughs> and how does this do? If you compare with data, and what is data for us right now, say numerical GR, numerical GR can also compute scattering angles. It's difficult, but they can. And be, uh, which energies they use? Uh, here is just one plot that I got. In this case, even there is some spin. Actually, this is not the plot that I want to show, but it doesn't really matter. Um, it, it works more or less the same also <coughs> for the non-spinning case, which is this is non-spinning. So you can look at, at this one point here. Uh, there is a plot which is the same when you vary here the angle like you vary here. But in all these plots, the same happened. You look at the angle that we had, and from this angle, you can infer, say, a potential. So there is always a match between, say, a Hamiltonian, and how that Hamiltonian gives you this angle. Now that you have a Hamiltonian, you can say, OK, this is my true theory. What is the full angle? I put it now into the full machine. Of course, we got it from the G4 angle, but let's assume that that G4 potential is exact, so we get a full angle, and that's what we use. Sometimes this is called resumation, and this is something that we study. Uh, this four post minkowskian resumation gives a very, very good agreement uh, with the numerical uh, waveforms, uh, the numerical scattering, ample, scattering angle, sorry, which is very suggestive that this, including the radiation, the, in fact, the conservative part doesn't do very, very good. The, is the radiation also very important to get this uh, beautiful uh, match. Um, OK, I don't know how much time I have, probably minus something. I can just scratch the surface of the basic question in this business. Now, you told me all this about scattering. How are you going to do the bound case? So how much time are you going to? Minus. minus five. OK, so shall I go back? <laughs> <laughs> um, so very quickly, how do we map this to this? OK? <clears throat> so how this was done originally, and, and, and I'm not complaining because this we do in post-Newtonian all the time. We did this for a living. And, and right now also, I'm, I was telling you that you match angles into Hamiltonians and you resum this way. It's a very special Hamiltonian in any case. But the, the way this was done originally by SV and, and company was, OK, they got an amplitude and they matched that amplitude into a theory in which you can predict from that amplitude, which Hamiltonian will give you that amplitude, say in a born approximation, including all the iterations, so this is the interaction. And then from there, you compute the observable. So that's the Hamiltonian that they got out of the amplitude. It, this is Newton. This is extremely uh, uh, uglier, because the amplitude, remember, just had the cinch. This is the 3PM, right? It just had the log of x, just the cinch. And now the Hamiltonian start getting all the things, because they are derivatives and so on. So it's not that pretty. Moreover. Oh, by the way, this made it into Sheldon's uh, bore, uh, this Hamiltonian. Um, but the question is, should you do this? And that is Paraguay. Where is it? That is Paraguay. That is Uruguay, OK? <laughs> <coughs> and uh, you know I predicted the future. <laughs> so the question is, like, why do we need a Hamiltonian? Is that the right thing to do? In amplitudes, all the time you hear on shell physics, you don't go off shell, you don't need to go off shell, why coordinates, again, me unobservable. So is it the correct thing to do? In many ways, it is, because you still need to solve a problem, right? 
differential forms are great, but I still want to see my coordinates in my tensors to do the calculation, right? So in some sense, it, 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 it's, it's back and forth. But this on-shell spirit suggests that there must be a better way uh, to do it. And this is uh, when Sheldon had the wrong beta function, and this woman doing loop quantum gravity came and corrected it, uh, talking about running, right? Uh, I forgot which episode. Um, anyway, so the question is, do we need a Hamiltonian, right? And the answer is no. And this is uh, uh, my, my, what I like to call Asimov moment, moment. Not the Eureka moment, but the Asimov moment. The Asimov moment is when the most exciting phrase in, in science is not the one that the Eral's uh, new discovery is not Eureka, but that's funny. What is funny? Well, what's funny here is the following. If you look at the scattering amplitude, uh, the scattering angle, how do you compute it? Well, usually what you do is you take what's so-called the radial action, which is an integral of this object, and you take a derivative with respect to the impact parameter or the angular momentum, and that's how you get this. You take a derivative of this, you get 1 over 2, this guy, and the g upstairs. And then the pi becomes, the 2 pi becomes pi. What is the periastrum advance? The same thing. It's the exact same calculation. What is the difference? The difference is that the radial action here is unbound, so it goes like halfway, right, if you complete the circle, uh, between r mean and infinity. And here you go between the zeros of the lips, right, the r minus and r plus. The zeros of this function for, um, for bound are too real. The zeros of this function for unbound is 1 at infinity because you're unbound, you're positive energy, you can live, and they are mean. But you're integrating the same thing. What does that mean? That means that if I have a way to relate these guys and these guys, maybe I can relate this to this. And lo and behold, it turns out that they are the same. It turns out that if you give me an angle, I can do an analytic continuation both from positive energy to negative energy, and from positive to negative angular momentum, and I can relate the scattering angle to the periastrum advance. So you give me the angle, I give you the periastrum advance. Uh, there are caveats, but this is basically the idea, and the reason is that you can relate those points, and, and this I'll tell you hopefully during the lectures, that the, you can find analytic continuations that said the zeros of this function you can find through this guy. These two roots you can find if you know this root through an analytic continuation. And therefore, you find that you can loop around and go to the ellipse, and then you deform the ellipses coming from the parabola back from the angle to the periastrum. <clears throat> and once you do that, once you know that, if you know the periastrum, you know the whole radial action. In fact, for these two whole, the unbound and bound radial actions have to be related. And if you know the whole unbound radial action from the angle, you know the full radial action, then you get all the observables. So all the observables, and here are conservative because those are the ones that don't include radiation, like the periastrum advance, it's not defined otherwise, uh, can be obtained through analytic continuation. And this is fantastic. Let me show you, an, and you can do it for a spin, but I don't have time. Let me show you an example. Remember the 2 p.m. angle that we had? Remember the GR periastrum advance, 3 over G squared? Well, this function now includes all the corrections in the energy to the 1 over J squared periastrum advance because this controls precisely the 1 over J of the radial action from the angle to all orders in velocity. So we have an exact match from here to the full GR effect to any PN order that has been done ever. Um, and the other ones you can do as well because we also have more data. So there's a beautiful map between you give me an angle, I know the periastrum, I know the radial action, I can compute observables. So very good for the conservative part. What do you do with the dissipative part? Well, if you look at the total radiated energy, why are you integrating the same thing? You're integrating a flux. In one case it's un uh, unbound, in the other case it's bound. But I just told you, I know how to relate the points. All I need to do is relate these dTs into dRs, and then I'm in business. Well, the Rs, there is analytic continuation now the same way that we did before because now the property of the radial action was that the J minus J, because it goes like J squared, was invariant. The same property here. So then you get that the total radiated energy for elliptic orbits by doing the same map is related to the total hyperbolic uh, radiation. The same happens um, with the uh, total radiated angular momentum. If you gave me the hyperbolic 
I can get the elliptic through analytic continuation, and here is a beautiful uh, example. The uh, hyperbolic case is way more complicated because you have these cosines and so on, but if you analytically continue the cosine, which gives you the pi's, you replace this by pi's, you look at the even ones in this case, Oh, this is minus, sorry, this one, the odds survive, and then they match beautifully. And I did nothing. I just did this calculation and mapped to the bound. And once I know this, I can map this to a flux, and if I know the flux, I can construct uh, waveforms. So all these analytic continuations are mapping one into the other without having to do almost any work. Uh, very good. So there is a problem here. I don't have much time to explain. It's that these tails, they spoil this, unfortunately. Um, this logarithm of B comes because there is a, a tail, there is a long wavelength field that makes it time uh, um, non-local, so there is a time non-locality associated with this contribution. The binding energies don't match beautifully as they did before, but now we know how to correct it. Oh, actually this was published, I should have changed it. Uh, we know how to correct it, don't get into the details, but now we know, we try to understand now how we go from the non-local to the non-local -lo part of this tail. So we have ways to continue making this boundary to bound dictionary work and apply directly scattering data into uh, bound states. And for example, to con just to compare, we constructed a, a Hamiltonian, which is right now probably the most accurate that has ever been done uh, with post-Minkowskian uh, techniques. Uh, very good, so I'm finishing. We control the vertical and the horizontal, like the outer limits. I don't know how you guys call it in Brazil. We call it dimension desconocida in Spanish. Um, and they started saying, like, don't touch your TV, right? We control the horizontal and the vertical. So we control post-Newtonian and post-Minkowskian with all these tools. Um, there's a lot of ideas here about how we connect one into the other, how we go into the amplitude, which I haven't uh, had time to tell you about. Uh, all these effective field theory uh, techniques that can also tell us about what is there uh, in terms of gravitational wave observations. Uh, the main idea, as I told you, is really the smoking gun of getting to these very high levels of precision. I really like what Kip Thorne said in 93, when this paper that I told you was called the last three minutes, because that's what we could see. And in, in this paper, which is now uh, uh, 30 years old, uh, more, uh, he was saying that the waveforms will be, and this is pre-LIGO, right, in 93, waveforms will be far more complex and carry more information than expected. Improved modeling will be needed for extracting the gravitational wave information. At that time, they, don't even, they didn't even have the 3PN. I think the 2.5, but I don't even remember the full 2PN was done. And nothing like numerical GR. They had no idea about anything. And he was going out and saying, look, guys, we're going to detect, and we have no idea what's out there. So now we are in very similar situation, much better, but similar. Uh, this talk I, I put here in 22, now in 24. Um, the future will be exactly like this. Right now, we don't have the models or the theoretical understanding to extract from the gravitational waves all the information that we can. And that's why we need to get to higher level of precision. That's why it's not good enough like before to assume that pi is 10, like astrophysicists did in the past. Now we actually need to do this very uh, precisely. Um, so I would say for the future, the answer, as I told you, is uh, uh, no, the future is going to be great. There is a whole new center dedicated to astrophysics in Germany, so the gravitational wave science is really blossoming, not just for astrophysics, I mean the, for relativists, for particle physicists, a whole community, an effort of people uh, pushing into a future for which we are not, uh, we're not yet ready, and thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot for this wonderful talk. Qu more questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> You're supposed to do the first, so they... <laughs> <laughs> So, so the question is: So we're using this for uh, for gravitational waves, you no know, black hole yeah. mergers. Can is that important also for PTA for pulsar time array signals, or this is? <laughs> no, that is a slightly different. Um, in, in in the other case, it, there is a lot of uncertainty about the amplitudes, not so much about the waveform because that's statistics, right? So stochastic, sorry. Uh, so it's not necessarily the same, uh, uh, the same uh, type of signal that we're trying to uh, look. You might say, well, what happens when Lisa starts seeing many signals at the same time? How you can distinguish those? Uh, 
how much we need to know the waveforms really well. I don't think that the precision will be needed for detection. It's more the data analysis challenge. But once you can disentangle them, you want to know them very well, so you're going to need precision. But this is something that people are really looking at. What happens when you have more than one signal overlapping? And that, uh, I, I, I'm not an expert. I have no much uh, idea about. And the pulse and time is interesting, because right now it doesn't fit the data, what we think is supermassive black hole weights. But there's so many uncertainties there, right? I'm not an expert, obviously, but people will tell you that it's not, uh, it's not a done deal, right? Most people will believe that this is astrophysical black hole. More questions? Was it all crystal clear? <laughs> Apparently, we don't have more questions, but we will have Rafael here for yes. many days, so people can talk more. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you.